I don't know what you think of when you hear we're going to be in Nehemiah. Some of you might think, ah, oh, Old Testament. Some of you might get discouraged. I think if you spend any time in, in ministry at all, it's, it's probably one of your favorite books or should be, or I hope at the end of our study will be one of your favorite books. Um, kind of got a big introduction to the book of Nehemiah. Is, are we good on video? Okay. Uh, Nehemiah means Yahweh comforts or to comfort or comfort of the Lord. And oftentimes this is a book that's studied or used to get refreshed. I found that it's actually a common book at pastor's conferences that's used to encourage um, men that teach the word of God. It's oftentimes taught as a uh, precursor before a church takes on a real large new project like our children's ministry wing or uh, a new missions orientated thing um, to encourage everyone to do their small part to accomplish what seems like an impossible mission. Uh, Nehemiah was a contemporary of Ezra. We just finished the book of Ezra last week or the week before. Also lived during the time of Malachi. But to give us some context to the book that we're beginning, a little kind of history lesson in case you haven't been hanging with us through all of our Old Testament study. The, the nation of Israel, the, ch the, the children of God, the, the Jews, fell into sin, fell specifically into idolatry, and they were taken captive and exiled to Babylon for 70 years. I should actually use this for a pop quiz for those of you that have been here. So they were held captive in exile for how long? 70 years. Nice. Good thing you wrote that down. <laughs> For 70 years, and a remnant was allowed to return. Remember, the hand of God changed the heart of the king, and they were allowed to return just a really small, in percentage to the whole that was taken captive, was allowed to return to the city of Jerusalem in 538 B.C. And they came in under the civil leadership of a guy named Zerubbabel. That was the first group of Jews that was led into the city of Jerusalem. And they specifically went there to rebuild the temple and to reestablish worship in that temple in the city of Jerusalem. Now, what we just wrapped up 60 years after that initial surge of people. Um, so 60 years later, 458 BC, Ezra, who was a scribe, leads this second group of people into Jerusalem. And Ezra went for a specific purpose. He went to, to teach the Jews the word of God, teach and remind them of the law of God, and teach them the proper worship of God. And all of that combined, what that should look like practically, day to day in their lives as they live, how, how would they apply that? So as we read in the book of Ezra, it was necessary. Ezra's ministry was necessary to these people because it didn't take long before the people became discouraged and compromised. Remember, they, they actually stopped building the temple. Didn't take them long to begin intermarrying with the different heathen groups around there. And he, even the religious leaders among them began participating in that. And remember the objection, God's objection to that had nothing to do with ethnicity or that they, they, they didn't look alike, but it had everything to do with idolatry. That's why they were taken captivity into captivity. In Ezra chapter 9, we read that, that they hadn't separated themselves from the peoples of the land with respect to their abominations. And those abominations were specifically worshiping other gods, worshiping false gods. So tonight, we begin the book of Nehemiah. That's 14 years after Ezra's return to Jerusalem. So 445 BC, Nehemiah returns to Jerusalem with the purpose of rebuilding the walls of Jerusalem. Now, I know at least one person in this room, when they hear that date, 445 BC, it begins to ring some bells. I know Rosaire can rattle off some numbers in relation to that date. We'll get to that at the end if we have time. Uh, so the things I hope to glean going through this book, be ready, man, in season, out of season, uh, not for the purpose of discouragement. Okay, when I say these things, I don't want you to be like, oh, this is so defeating and discouraging, but rather preparation. God's work 
when we're called to do God's work, it's never easy. You know, we think it will be. We'll th we, we think that, you know, God, I'm your guy, I'm your gal, and I'm following you, and my life is fully surrendered to you, and, and I want to do your will in my life. So my prayer is, could you, could you make the path straight? Could you make, actually, not just straight, could you make it like slightly downhill? And then have it lined both sides of the road with cheerleaders. And not empty-handed, just like praises, but snacks, maybe Gatorade along the way, encouragement. That's, that's I think, sometimes how we think when we go into ministry or we're just obedient to God, what life is going to be like. But I'll tell you, God's work is never easy. God's work is always, because we have an enemy and there's a spiritual war, God's work is always met with opposition. And the man of God or the woman of God that's faithful in their service to God is always attacked. That doesn't seem fair, does it? The good thing about going through this book is we get to see all of those tactics that the enemy uses. And we get to see, I believe, a powerhouse of a man, faithful to God. And, and when I say powerhouse, when I talk of Nehemiah as that, I don't want you to think like big and buff or a, a mixed martial arts fighter or something like that. I'm grateful for people who have muscles and, you know, when we need to move stuff and, and all of that. But a spiritual giant in that he was a man of prayer, a spiritual giant in that he was a man of action. And those are the guys, if I ever have to go into battle, guys and gals that are faithful to prayer, they're who I want with me in battle. So why, just, just that introduction, that the work of God is always hard and it's never easy. And the man of God or the woman of God is always attacked and they're always met with opposition. Why would that be an important thing for us to know or for us to glean from the book of Nehemiah? Be prepared. I mean, if, if you go in with expectations of, what does Nick always say, rainbows and unicorns, you know, or you think it's going to be easy street, <laughs> uh, and it's not, how do you feel? If you think somebody's, something's going to be awesome, and it's really, really hard, and, and not everybody's loving you for it, what happens? Get discouraged. Get defeated. Sometimes... Uh, does doubt ever set in? You know, God, was this, was this of you or is this some crazy idea I thought up, you know? Did you really call me to do this? Did you really, was it really you that said I should teach Sunday school or be involved in children's ministry or VBS? Because this is really, really hard. These third graders are mean, you know? <laughs> and they know more about parts of the Bible. It can be discouraging. So it's important to know these things. Uh, so let's just dig in and we'll see how far we go. Now, when you see Nehemiah chapter 2, don't, don't panic. We're not going to try to do the whole thing. But the words, Nehemiah chapter 1, verse 1, the words of Nehemiah, the son of Hekeliah, it came to pass in the month of Chislev. The month of Chislev would have been um, November, December, kind of winter time, okay? It came to pass in the month of Chislev in the 20th year as I was in Shushan, the citadel or the city. The Shushan would have been the, the winter palace place for the Persian kings, modern day Iraq, about 150 miles north of the Persian Gulf. Context, that's where Nehemiah is, right? It says, the words of Nehemiah, the son of Hekeliah, came to pass in the month of Chislev in the 20th year. I was in Shushan. So Shushan is like a thousand miles from Jerusalem. So he wasn't physically present. He's in this other city. And then verse 2 says that Hananiah, one of my brethren, and when we get to, I think, chapter 7, we'll find out that he actually was his brother. One of my brethren came with men from Judah, and I asked them concerning the Jews who had escaped, who had survived the captivity, and concerning Jerusalem. I know it's hard when we chop things up for you to get like a big picture of what's going on, but I think there's some important things that I don't want to miss. And, and one is, Nehemiah asked. Nehemiah had concern for his brethren. Nehemiah cared about how the Jews were in Jerusalem. He cared about the city. He cared about the progress they were making. And he cared about the people. And I know, not for you guys that are here on a Wednesday night, but maybe the ones listening online 
having care and concern about others is like a foreign concept today. You know, anything other than me right now, what's going on? How am I being blessed? But he asked. He asked concerning the Jews who had escaped, who had, who had gone out of Babylon, had gone back to Jerusalem, who had survived the captivity concerning Jerusalem. He asked how they were. That's, that's the heart of somebody in ministry, concern for others. And they said, he gets a response, verse 3. And they said to me, the survivors who are left from the captivity in the province are there in great distress and reproach. Remember, you're serving God. It's, it's going to be tough. They're in great distress and reproach. The wall of Jerusalem is also broken down, and its gates are burned with fire. Kind of discouraging. You know, you're, you're going to rebuild the temple. You're the remnant that God has chosen to reestablish worship in Jerusalem. And, and you go to this city, and it's in distress. And the people themselves are a reproach. Remember, they're, they're already compromised. And Jerusalem itself is broken down. The gates have been burned with fire. Nebuchadnezzar, the king that, that attacked Jerusalem three different times, right? Finally, on the third time, he's like, this is crazy. I'm tearing down these walls. Walls were a fortress of protection. And um, so the gates are burned with fire. Verse four, so it was when I heard these words, look at this reaction. I sat down and I wept. In the, the Hebrew means poured out. I wept. I mourned for many days. I, this is not like a, I want to guilt you out. But just a question. This is his response. He asks how these other Jews are doing a thousand miles away. And, and they're met with tough times. And the city's broken down. So it was when I heard these words that I sat down and I wept. When's the last time, guys, that we wept for the sake of a brother or sister, for the sake of martyrs, you know, the people that die for their faith, or the sake of a, a neighbor or a family member that's lost and doesn't know Jesus and short of salvation has a destiny in hell? We, we get so complacent and so calloused. And that, that was part of what was going on with the Jews, both those that stayed in Babylon and then those that were here. It was like, you know what? This is real. It's hard when you serve God and you meet opposition and that's just the way it is. And I'm discouraged. And I'm going to just plod on. And this is how life is. And accepting of that, in a sense, this less than satisfying life following God, this defeated life, but not Nehemiah. Nehemiah gets word of the condition of these people and he is broken. And, and, you know, as I've read this, and, and again, this is not to guilt you out. When I read this, my question to myself was, what would it take for me to be like that about someone other than myself, someone outside of my immediate family, to be broken and grieved like that? Because that's the heart of God, guys. That's the heart of God to everyone in this community that doesn't know Jesus. And then he goes beyond that, right? He weeps and he mourns for many days. This, this man is broken. And then he begins fasting and praying. And Jesus says in the New Testament, when you fast. So it's something that we should practice. But I think our whole concept of fasting today is so far off of what it was. It's, it's not to manipulate God. It's not to pressure God into doing something. But fasting here is, anybody ever been on a mission trip or overseas or someplace other than our culturally advanced Old Town, Maine. You know, you, you go someplace like that. I went to Honduras a number of years ago, and literally the people there that were preparing meals would get up early in the morning, and they would gather wood for a fire, and they would start boiling water and, and um, warming pots to, to cook eggs in. Lunch started about a half hour after that to boil water and make rice. This was just the preparation of food it was an all-day event. So that was part of the idea of fasting. All of that time that you spend in preparation, the time that you would spend eating, the time that you would spend, up, spend cleaning, set that time aside and spend it in prayer and seeking God, seeking to hear from God. Today, we, we, we think of, I mean, you can go through a drive through in, what, 90 seconds and get like 18,000 calories for under five bucks, you know? And, and fasting, like the time is nothing for most of us. But 
So he weeps for days. He begins fasting and praying before the God of heaven. I mentioned Nehemiah was a man of prayer. I think we actually have 10 prayers recorded as we go through this book. So he's, he's seeking God. And he says in verse 5, I pray, Lord God of heaven, O great and awesome God. Who remembers the first part of the Lord's Prayer? Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name, or holy is your name. It, it starts off as prayer, right? That's how Jesus taught us to pray. Look at this prayer. I pray, Lord God of heaven, O great and awesome God. It, this is not flattery. You know, this is a recognition of who God is. Who God is holy, righteous, but also who God is in perspective of us. I loved one of the things Jim pointed out um, going through Habakkuk last week was, was Habakkuk questioning the judgment of God. And then his response is, God, I don't understand this. And when I'm corrected, like I don't agree with it all. And if I don't agree with you, it means I'm wrong. Like he got that, you know, and, and that's the idea of this prayer is Lord God of heaven, you are great. You are awesome. You who keep your covenant and mercy with those who love you and observe your commandments. So he lays out, I think, to remind himself as much as anything, rather than just heap praise on. You observe your commandments. Verse six says, please let your ear be attentive and your eyes open that you may hear the prayer of your servant, which I pray before you now, day and night for the children of Israel, your servants, and confess the sins of the children of Israel, which we have sinned against you, right? When we sin, it's against God. We think, well, I didn't hurt anybody. I didn't bother anybody else. It's always a sin against a holy, righteous God. So he starts out with praise for God, and then he goes to confession, actually confessing the sins of the children of Israel, which we, he includes himself in that, a thousand miles away, which we have sinned against you, both my father's house and I have sinned, We've acted very corruptly against you and have not kept the commandments, the statutes, nor the ordinances which you commanded your servant Moses. Verse 8, remember, I pray the word that you commanded your servant Moses, saying, if you were unfaithful, I will scatter you among the nations. What happened to him? Taken into captivity, right? Exiled to Babylon. That happened. And, and Nehemiah is saying, God, you warned us of that. If we didn't do this, you would do that. If we were unfaithful, You'll scatter us among the nations. So he acknowledges the sin, acknowledges the, the justice and the consequence of what happened. And then verse 9, he says, but if you return to me. So he goes on to quote God further and keep my commandments and do them, though some of you were cast out to the furthest part of the heavens. Okay, I'm going to try this real quick. If it doesn't work, you can take over. You can get that if you need to. All right. <clears throat> For this part of the heavens, yet I will gather them from there and bring them to the place which I have chosen as a dwelling for my name. God, you said this would happen and we were scattered, but you also said if we return and that's why I'm here. I'm here to build this wall. Let's back up. Nah, let's keep going. Gather them from there. I know my game seven guys were just like, whew. gather them from there and bring them to the place which I've chosen as a dwelling for my name. God, this is your word. You're a faithful God. You promised this. Verse 10, now these are your servants and your people whom you have redeemed by your great power and by your strong hand. What is Nehemiah doing there? Is it, he's quoting a promise of God. But he's claiming a promise of God. You know, I, I'm, not, I'm not a name it, claim it guy. You know, throw it in God's face or, or what's the other name it, claim it? Blab it, something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But we ought to know the promises of God. Why? Because he's faithful to his word. 
You know, and, and we ought to have promises. Maybe you got a Bible promise book, or, or when you've been in a trial, you look through, and God makes promises. And it's okay to say, God, here's what you say in your word. And this applies to my situation. And I'm claiming that. And that's what, that's what Nehemiah is doing here. Now, these are your servants, God. Verse 10, and your people whom you've redeemed by your great power and by your strong hand. O oh Lord, I pray, please let your ear be attentive to the prayer of your servant and to the prayer of your servants whose desire to fear your name, whose desire fear your name, and let your people, let your servant prosper this day, I pray, and grant him mercy in the sight of this man. For I was the king's cupbearer. Anybody know what the cupbearer did? Huh? Check food. He bore the cup, right? It, uh, being wealthy, being a king, the kings were known to consume a lot of wine. And that was basically the job of the cupbearer. The king wants a glass of wine. You try it. If you're not dead, the king will drink it. So it was a, a highly trusted position, one with some risk and great responsibility. But that was the role of the cupbearer, to, to taste the wine to make sure it was safe for the king. But think about the position that, they, that, that would put him in, you know, to be at the right hand of the king. Think about the things that the cupbearer would have overheard or been a part of, been in the room for. It was a position of high trust and high honor. But let me ask you this, why was Nehemiah going to Jerusalem? To, to rebuild the wall, to motivate the people, to do this, all of these things. What does a cupbearer know about rebuilding a wall or, or doing any of those things? This is not a trick question. I'm saying, is, is, isn't that a bizarre choice of God? You know, what do a bunch of fishermen know about spreading the gospel? A bizarre choice of God. I mean, look, look at our own movement. Look at Calvary Chapel. What a bizarre choice of God. The men and women that he's used in this ministry. I mean, I don't know how many of you guys have been in a church and, and you get involved in the ministry. Maybe you start serving in that ministry and then you get into, you know, what's known in the world as the inner circle or the, the you know what I mean. And then you get in that inner circle and you see that the people in that inner circle or in the leadership of the church are failed human beings, you know, and you get disillusioned and discouraged. I can say that there's not a single not a single man in our movement, not a single pastor in the Calvary Chapel movement that, that I don't look at and say, man, that's by the grace of God. You know, that God uses them. You know, you, God uses the simple things. It, nobody looks at your pastor and says, it's his talent. <laughs> it's, his, it's his ability to pronounce the Greek and Hebrew language, you know, or even English most of the time, if you were here Sunday. God works in such a way that it brings him honor and it brings him glory. That's why he uses us, the foolish things of the earth, to confound the wise. That's why he used a cupbearer to do this. Do you think, do you think Nehemiah, the cupbearer, when, when this wall is built, this great wall is built around Jerusalem and he organizes all the people, that anybody's like, man, that was one, one unbelievable cupbearer. The glory went to God. You know? It's, it's not... It's not our ability that God looks for. It's, it's our availability. You know, you guys have heard it said, he doesn't call the equip, he equips the called. But one common thing I always see in ministry is a feeling of, people with a true heart of ministry, is a feeling of inadequacy. Like, God, I'm just not equipped for this. Or I, I could never do that. I've told you guys a number of times on my way to a chaplain call, it's like, Lord, you got to show up. What am I going to do? What am I going to say? Isn't there anybody else around here that can do this? And God miraculously shows up. And, and that's what we see him do with Nehemiah. It's not ability. It's availability. And that way he gets the glory. God makes what seems to us some crazy choices, crazy decisions, but it's so that he'll get the glory. So, other things that the work of God always requires is, and this was a lesson that was painfully learned by Nicole and I, but it, God's work always requires the, the right person, 
right? The person that God cho- chooses, not necessarily the most talented, the best looking, um, any of that, the right place and the right time. You know, those were things that we believed we were being called into ministry and you get all excited and it's confirmed by others, confirmed by our pastor and we're going to be set out. But we started going to different places and praying about where and all kinds of suggestions from other people. But God didn't confirm that with us. God didn't confirm it with me. God didn't confirm it with my wife until three and a half years later. You know, and I know guys that have gone out to, to plan a ministry. They, they've got the city and they're the right person and they go and it's just hard later or it bombs. Hard labor and it bombs. And it's not that they misheard God because that three and a half years, it was, God, are we, are we crazy? Is this something I wanted? Is this something I didn't hear you right? And you question all that and he confirms all that. But it's the right person in the right place at the right time. And, and I think sometimes we're okay when we ask God for things. When he says yes, we're always okay with that. We're even okay when he says no. But when he says wait, you know, you might be the right person and that might be the right town or community or place of ministry, but the time might not be right. And we got to wait for all three of those. And that's the reason why I say that is that's what Nehemiah did. He, he, he is broken and he weeps and he fasts and he prays and he, he, he such a heart for these people. And then we get to chapter two and chapter two says, and it came to pass in the month of Nisan. Used to be Dotson, I think. In the month of Nisan, some of you guys don't even remember Dotson's, do you? It came to pass in the month of Nisan in the 20th year of King Artaxerxes. So that, that's four months later. He, he's broken. God send me. Let, let me go do this. And it's four months that he waits. He was the right guy. He knew where he had to go. He knew he had, what he had to do. But it was four months later. So he got the wait. In the 20th year of King Artaxerxes, when wine was before him, that I took the wine and I gave it to the king. Now I had never been sad in his presence before. Anybody have any idea why that would be a big deal? Yeah? Because he was the cupbearer. Yet, if you were sad or gloomy or downtrodden in front of a king, that was perceived as a reflection of your displeasure with him or your displeasure with his rule or, or his, his organization or any of those things. So you always, like, like a pastor, right, always comes up and is always bubbly and happy no matter what's going on in their life, right? Not true. But... That was really the role of the cupbearer. You weren't the jester. You didn't have to make jokes and stuff. But any, any displeasure was a reflection on your opinion of the king. So I had never been sad in his presence before. Verse, three, or verse 2 says, Therefore the king said to me, Why is your face sad? Instantly noticeable. Whatever's going on with him, whatever he was showing, Why is your face sad since you're not sick? This is nothing but sorrow of heart. So he... If we were there, if we were viewing this from the outside in, we'd be looking and be like, Nehemiah is in a bad spot right now. This is going to get ugly. And, and you'd be worried about him. It was not acceptable to be like that in front of a king. So, so I became dreadfully afraid and said to the king, so that, that's how big of a deal it is. He's affected by it. He becomes dreadfully af- afraid. May the king live forever. Why should my face not be sad? When the city, the place of my father's tombs, lies waste and its gates are burned with fire. So he begins to explain his sadness. He begins to explain his displeasure, which is taking a huge risk when you're in front of this king. Notice he doesn't say what city it is or where, and there's a reason for that. Um, If you know historically, let's go on just a little bit further. Then the king said to me, what do you request? Okay, get to the point. You're upset. The city's in in a mess. What is it that you want? He knows the position he's in. So before he responds, it says, I prayed to the God of heaven. And I said to the king, if it pleases the king and your servant has found favor in your sight, I ask that you send me to Judah, to the city of my father's tombs, that I may rebuild it. So here's part of the problem. 
that we don't have in this story, but we pick up in the scriptures. Artaxerxes, this king that he's talking to, had previously ordered the Jews to stop rebuilding the walls around Jerusalem. Okay, so he knows this. And then he's saying, king, give me permission. You know, maybe you've been in a spot where you feel like you're called to a certain ministry and somebody else has said, no, that's not going to work or this isn't going to happen. But you know you're being called by God. And that was the situation Nehemiah was in here. So he boldly says to the king um, in, in verse 5, if it pleases the king, if your servant has found favor in your sight, and he was the cupbearer, I ask that you send me to Judah, to the city of my father's tombs, that I may rebuild it. Then the king said to me, the queen also sitting beside him, how long will your journey be and when will you return? So it pleased the king to send me and I set him a time. Furthermore, I said to the king, if it pleases the king, let letters be given to me for the governors of the region beyond the river that they must permit me to pass through till I come to Judah. And a letter to Asaph, the keeper of the king's forest, that he must give me timber, pretty bold, huh? to make beams for the gates of the citadel, which pertains to the temple for the city wall and for the house that I will occupy. And the king granted them to me according to the good hand of my God upon me. I want to take a break there because of the difficulty that we have when we hear wait from God. <sighs> Confession. When I pray, when I go to God, when I have a need, a desperate need. My perspective is that I'm God's only problem that day. You know, God, will you hear me? Will you just, will you deal with this thing? It's really, really important to me. So could you drop everything else? Sort of, not really, but I think that is at times our perspective. Like, why do I have to wait? You're God. You know, but we don't always know what's going on behind the scenes and what's happening and, and why why the wait? You know, even, even this church plant, the, the timing of the Lord and, and gifts that were given to purchase this building and different things that wouldn't have happened if we did that three and a half years sooner in our flesh, if we didn't wait on God. But he has to wait four months. And then he goes to this king and he asks, this king who had already said, you guys need to stop rebuilding these walls. And he specifically asks, again in verse eight, to give me the, not just permission, but provision Give me the timber to make beams for the gates of the citadel, which pertains to the temple for the city wall, for the city wall, specifically the walls, and for the house that I will occupy. Also, you know, set up a little place for me, king. And the king granted them to me according to the good hand of my God upon me. Now, I imagine Nehemiah in that four months was going through all that questioning and, and wondering why and, and if God was going to answer and all of that. But I want you to look at something. If you'll turn over with me to the book of Daniel. Daniel chapter 9. Because I think we have the answer here to the why he had to wait four months. Let me see if I can pull it up. Daniel chapter 9, starting in verse 24. Seventy weeks are determined for your people. Mind you, this was written 95 years before Nehemiah went to King Artaxerxes. Okay? So keep that in perspective. Seventy weeks are determined for your people and for your holy city to finish the transgression, to make an end of sins, to make reconciliation for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy. Now, therefore, I and I'm sorry, know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the command to restore and rebuild Jerusalem, what did, what did Nehemiah just get from King Artaxerxes? The, the command to rebuild and restore, right? To, re, to, to restore and rebuild Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince. There shall be seven weeks and 62 weeks, or literally 69 sevens. The street shall be built again and the wall, even in troublesome times. That's exactly what was going on. That's exactly the report he got back from his brother. Things are bad there. It's troublesome times. 
but he says the streets shall be built again in the wall. And after the 62 weeks, Messiah shall be cut off, right? Or, or, or crucified. So we wonder why he had to wait four months. When he goes before the king in Nehemiah chapter two, and he specifically asks for that permission, if it pleases the king, send me, and I set a time. Make beams for the gate of the citadel, which pertains to the temple for the city wall and for the house of God. And the king granted them. That four months set the granting of this um, petition to March 14th, 445 BC. Remember that's when Nehemiah, the book of Nehemiah, 445 BC. That date, March 14th, 445 BC, is when this order was given. That 69 sevens is 483 years, which literally is 1,700, 7, 1,773, 880 days. After that, the Messiah will reveal himself, the triumphal entry into Jerusalem. So had he gone on his own flesh, that prophecy written 95 years before that wouldn't have come to pass. You know, but it did come to pass to the day on April 6th, 32 AD, the triumphal entry. And then remember Jesus comes in and then he weeps. Why, why does it say he weeps for the city? Because they didn't know their day. They should have known their day. They should have known this prophecy. So when I pray and it's like, God, could you fix this for me today? We don't always know what's going on behind the scenes or, or what else is going to happen or why I, have to, why I have to wait or why there's the delay. We worship a big God, guys. Um, so much in Nehemiah, I think you'll find encouraging. I will stop there. Um, we'll pray. Father, thank you, Lord, so much just for the revelation of your scriptures, how we see that it all from Genesis to Revelation all ties together. Lord, and, and proves itself when we examine these things. These prophecies that were made, Lord, they're so easy to just read, uh, read over. And, and even this permission given to rebuild the wall, big deal. It is such a big deal. Lord, when we put it in context of you being a God that's faithful, you being a God of your word, and, and the things that were prophesied come to pass exactly to the day. Just evidence, Lord, proof of your existence, proof of of your son and, and your love for us. So we thank you so much for your word. Please continue to change us as we go through it. In Jesus' name, amen.